All right. Oh, do you know what though? What? We just started the recording. We're going. Um, <laughs> that'll work. We're good. I was going to do the voice to text. Okay. All right, you guys. Welcome. Love you. We think about you all the time. Rich and I just had a five week vacation with our family. It was amazing. Had some really cool experiences. Some of them I shared on the podcast. If you haven't listened to the stories, had, a, had an opportunity to rescue a guy that got hurt on a hike. And oh man, we had some cool experiences. It was really fun. Five weeks of vacation. Actually, it was supposed to be three weeks and then it turned into five. But yeah, because you know we bought a van. Yeah. Oh, we bought a new van. Adventure new vehicle. van. Because we awesome. realized after making this long road trip that we knew this, but it was. <laughs> Emphasize that our family of nine does not fit in an eight-seater vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> we need more space, people. So we bought a 12-passenger one. Oh, nice. Well, thanks. Love that podcast. Send it to your son. Thanks, Mary, for doing that, sharing that. You guys love it. Okay, let's dive in. Um, so last month was all about trust. And I hope you worked on building or rebuilding trust. And I hope you like realized just how powerful trust is. Like nothing will move in life, not in business, not in family, not in your marriage. Like if you don't hit it hard, like it's, it's, it, there's this distance, there's this barrier. And sometimes it's like a silent barrier. Sometimes that you can feel it, it's palpable. And sometimes it's just clearly obvious. It's like, I don't trust you. Well, and I think that it's not something you necessarily think about a lot because when we think about trust, it's kind of in these certain areas, but the more, I don't know, especially going through this month for us, I've realized just how much having high levels of trust comes into play in like every aspect of our life, in our marriage, in our parenting, in I mean, everything you do, you have to be able to trust yourself, right? That's a huge component. Like we, we can't believe that we're going to achieve any of the things that we set out to achieve. And we have big goals. Like you should see my plans for next year, <laughs> right? Like it's unbelievable, really. But there's no way we can believe that we're going to achieve those things and all things that we've achieved all so far, unless we already have high levels of trust in ourselves. And then have high levels of trust with each other. Like I have to know that Greg's going to be able to do what he says he's going to do. And he's going to follow through and he's going to be on board and like all these things or else none of it's going to happen. Same with our kids. And in fact, having my kids be able to trust me is a huge motivator for me. And I'm not just talking about like, oh, trust. Well, trust that I'm going to do what I'm going to say, but on a bigger level than that. When I talk about my big goals and dreams, right? It motivates me to become the person that's going to fulfill those dreams. Because like my worst nightmare, like worst case scenario for me is being, well, yeah, mom always talked about big things. She always had big goals and dreams, but she never actually like fulfilled them. Like that to me. Clarifying that that one day our kids would actually think that about her. Yeah, that they would actually think that about me. Now, I've already fulfilled a lot of dreams, right, that I talked about with my kids. I'm like, let's travel the world. Let's do this. And we've made that happen. But I have more goals and dreams. Like, we want to have a chateau in France. We want to, you know, all these other things we want to do. And I don't want to be the talker that never actually fulfills that. That to me is a level of trust. If I talk about big goals and dreams, I am pretty dang sure going to fulfill those. <laughs> I was going to swear, but you know, it's not swearing in Australia. So I should just damn say it. Okay. <laughs> so that's one of us is like, oh, that's not swearing. I know. <laughs> the rest of I know. them. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to do that. Okay. I'm going to fulfill it because I'm not going to be that person that ends up being the big talker and the big dreamer. I get pretty passionate about this because that's one of my pain points. I'm not going to be that person. I am going to fulfill these big dreams and goals that I talk to my family and my kids about. And that to me comes down to trust. My kids can trust that I'm going to do the work to make it happen. I can trust myself that I'm going to make it happen. So trust is huge. Trust is big. 
That was my rant. For oh, oh, it was good. That's a good rant, huh? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so let me ask a quick question. You guys start in the chat here. What's one area, and we're going to move on to a different topic today for the new month, but what's one area of your life where you need to increase trust? And it might be trust in yourself and your ability and capability. It might be an area of your life that's like following through. And maybe some emphasis on that one. What area of your life do you know you need to be more consistent, more dedicated, more disciplined, more determined to get things done? I want some interaction here, not just, I, want you, I don't want you guys to be passive there. No passive listening today. I want you to be active and in it. So throw in the chat, like what area of your life do you want to up level your trust? Trust in yourself. Um, trust and let's just focus on that you can be trusting others too but like what area of your life do you want to have more trust and for me I was making a video for the group um, yesterday and I was I was told the story about how I used to have an identity of being a starter I would start lots of different things but not finish them right and not pay attention to the details and not do things um, all the way through I used to have that identity and I really loved to blame it on my personality. Like that's the way I am, right? I, I, I'm just a starter. I'm a creative. I'm a thinker. I'm a visionary. I don't like to fill things, right? And so, of course, that created a lack of trust in myself and a lack of trust in me from others because if I didn't finish things, if I didn't follow them all the way through, then how could I trust myself? How could she trust me? How could my kids trust me? I'm like, oh yeah, dad. <laughs> you always in. say it, you and your ideas and you start up, but you never finish it. You with me? Is this which, sneaking in? Which, I mean, I want to add another aspect of that, which in some ways is fine as long as you have enough capability and competence to get help in finishing that, whether you're outsourcing that to someone or getting people on board with the vision to be a, a team that does it together, right? Like it's okay to recognize where you're not strong, but if you just talk about it and you never do anything to help people f help you finish your goals and dreams, that's where the problem is. So either, yeah, either learning how to do it yourself or outsourcing it. If, if you, and I do this a lot too, like I don't want to do that. That's not a strength I have. It's not an area of focus. I want to focus on my strengths then I'm, I'm responsible. I'm responsible for the details and the finishing of that. And I need to either need to hire someone or outsource or do something to make sure it's going to get done. So then she can still trust me. Like, well, if he, if he can't do it or, or doesn't do it, it's, he's going to make sure it gets done. Mm -hmm. You think that makes sense? Okay. Good stuff coming in here. Let's, let's yeah, read these. So sorry. I got to look over one camera to see <laughs> the other one. Um, uh, um, I'd love to trust in God more and my ability. And here's how you increase trust in God is your ability to hear and work through his messages to me. Right. So it comes back to self-trust again, right? Self-trust can increase, increase the trust in God. Love that. That's beautiful. I uh, want to focus on husband being on board with mutual goals and attitudes. Love that. I know most of you, well, no, all of us have to do that. All of us have to have a spouse that's on board or things will be kind of a little disjointed and a little bit harder to, to accomplish. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I just share something? Cause I was on my run this morning. I was listening to this excellent book called extreme ownership. And the section I listened to in there, they talked about taking full and complete responsibility for whether or not she's on board. It's my responsibility for her being on board. Now I sound, I know that sounds a little up front. You're like, what are you crazy? No. But what it comes down to is me being able to very clearly articulate to her. So she, there are no gaps in her understanding. She completely understands why it is so important to me. And I'm using all diplomacy and tact to gently and lovingly persuade her to get influencer. on influencer that was actually the exact thing i thought of was influence because yeah i was going to say it a different way but basically in order to get anyone on board right with your goals and dreams that might be your spouse your children anyone else who needs 
you need their help to accomplish it, right? Which is you, a lot of people. Which can be a lot of people. You have to develop the power of influence. That's what being a leader is all about. You're a leader because you can influence other people by articulating what the vision is that you see and being able to help them understand it. You have a vision in your head of what you want. That's your goals and dreams. And the only way you're going to make it happen is if you get other people on board with it. And that's by learning how to help them see that same vision. And you have to take responsibility for doing that and getting that vision in their head. Now, this is fun. It's fun right now because we're actually working with our teenagers and teaching them how to communicate because they haven't learned how to communicate effectively yet. And so they'll say Completely. something. <laughs> they'll just say, they'll say, hey, can I, can I borrow that thing? And I'm like, what thing? You know the thing. No, I don't know the thing. Like, we know that thing you use. Can I borrow that thing? I'm like, what thing? <laughs> our, our son, he's funny. He does this consistently. He'll be like, do you remember that time we jumped in that light, that lake? That was amazing. <laughs> and our response to him always is like, what which, which what country? country? Which, which, which country? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? about? You got to give us some details, brother. We jumped in a hundred lakes, like across five continents. Like, what are you talking about? And he's always like, no, no, you remember the one time we talked to that guy? That's how I started saying He'll be like, oh, you guys remember that one time we talked to that guy? And we're like, well, dude, give us some context. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but what's interesting is a lot of adults never grew out of that form of adolescent communication. They'll be like, hey, you want to travel? Yeah. What do you, and so in, you come visit? in our mind, when we say it, we have one vision of what that looks like. It's our family in a place, having a cool experience, bonding. And to somebody else, our spouse, you want to travel means something else. It means, oh, all the logistics and sitting at the airport and like all this, like you're envisioning totally different things by using the same word. So you have to learn how to be able to use the right words that influence that person and help them create the same emotions that you're feeling. Otherwise, you guys, we end up in this problem of like, I told Rachel why it matters to me. She knows. And she just doesn't care. And we start doing an us versus them and we start to get in this battle and it seems like we're enemies. Instead, the reality is she's like, I don't know why he's so passionate about that. I don't know why he keeps getting so upset about it. Like, what's the big deal? Why is she, why is he so this, right? We've got to communicate that more effectively. Okay, let's keep going on the list. Good stuff here. Um, I've been reading uh, the book by Corey Tenboom called Tramp for the Lord. Oh. Hashtag life wow. goals. I haven't oh, read that. Good. We actually went to their house. I saw that book at Ten their house. house. Yeah, the Temple House in Holland. Cool. So special, you guys. Love it. Um, let's see. I need to trust myself that I can actually build my business mm -hmm. successfully and be more consistent working towards that. We're going to talk all about that today, girl. <laughs> we Woo! should talk a little bit about it right now. Well, we're going to spend the whole time just. <laughs> okay. All right. So Identity. And we're going to remember that. That's right. Yeah, we're I know. We're I'm just. We're getting that. Hint. And it's the part of the trusting yourself. Okay. Uh, I need to trust or even know that I can make a business. I have no idea how. And also, as Lindy said, I, I would love to hear God's voice. Love that, you guys. This is awesome. Stacy! Oh, man. We missed you. Hi, Stacy. <laughs> I want to trust myself to follow through with the healing protocol needed to improve and fix a health issue I'm having. Beautiful, right? And you guys, that's true for all of us. Because we might know what we need to do to be healthier, but do we actually do it? Do we follow through? Again, the identity piece, we're going to hit that hard today. Mm -hmm. Be excited, people. Be excited. No, for real, it's like put a smile on your face. I can see some <laughs> of your cameras and you're not smiling. <laughs> no, for real, smile. <laughs> there we go. That's a beautiful smile, Nathan. I love it, man. I love it. All right. Trust ourselves to Mr. make you, Stacey. and follow through with bigger goals and still some fear. Yeah. Okay. Hands up if you what? get afraid of your big goals. Throw them still up. Some fear. Yeah. Throw them up, man. Yeah. I do. Oh, me too. And big goals should be scary. They should be scary, man. They're not if, scary. They're if not you big set enough. a goal in your life, I'm not afraid of that goal. It's not big enough, friends. <laughs> it is not big enough. You got to level up. Gotta level up. Okay. Um, keep going. 
Yeah. I also excited at 1120 p.m. Rachel's Way desire. I'm always talking about dreams and my kids are almost at the point where they say, whatever, mom, you always talk about these big things that never happen. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Feeling that. I think we all are feeling that. And we got to, that's what we're talking about today. That's a perfect lead in. Thank you. You guys, I could pay you for your comments because they're just the perfect lead in <laughs> to where okay. we're going to hit. Okay. So. This month, my friends, is all about action, right? Remember, so you remember in the Extraordinary Family Life Formula, I'm going to review it real quick. The five elements. I would love to do a quiz someday and see if you guys could name the <laughs> elements. <laughs> in the middle. So the five Sometimes elements are I wonder if I can name you, them. your marriage, parenting, family culture and dynamics, and family finances, right? Those are the elements. Remember, the acronym METAL. Metal then applies to each of the five elements, right? So metal. And, and there's a whole Mindset. meaning behind that. Mindset. Emotions. Emotions. Trust. Trust. Action. And now action, baby. Woo! And we're going to talk about action and then lifestyle is the L. So we're going to talk about action. So just to get this rolling, since you guys are just sitting there totally passively, <laughs> at least like move your body. Everybody move your body a little bit. There's, there's a... <laughs> There's a method behind our madness. You gotta move your body, man. Oh, move your body. You we make our be... kids do that when they're grumpy. We're like, move your body, change your state. Come on, do something. We, we even did our, Take our your Wim Hof breathing exercises today as a family. We did our gratitude, 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 gratitude intention practices. We should could call it gratitude. gratitude. I love it. Gratitude and intention. All right, boop. You all in? We're going to action, okay? So now there are three main elements. If you're taking notes today, which I hope you are, we got three main elements. So I got three cards here. Oh, now I, I want to really emphasize though, how this ties directly into trust because the way to build trust in yourself, even trust with God and you know, with your family and your kids is taking action. So that's why this is such a perfect connection here is that's how, you build trust is taking action that's it. I just, i'm confused here where should i look right here right there <laughs> all right i'm like <laughs> yeah. i don't know where to look you got a complex <laughs> camera microphone system going on here you guys okay a hey, laura put your virtual hand up did you have a question or comment or were you just raising your hand for one of the things if you guys have questions and comments we want to hear from oh you. i was gonna tell you I kind of hinted at maybe we would try a new thing with coaching. Yeah, I'm down with that. So we can't explain that. I'll do some coaching. Well, should we explain that now and see if they want to do it later? Yep. Do you want to explain it? So I'm going to attempt to explain <laughs> Rachel's idea. <laughs> Remember that one idea I had that one time? Uh, uh huh. Yeah. You want to explain yeah. that? <laughs> so, no, you guys, we would, um, we're happy to love to actually do some try it. coaching. If so, you guys are up for this, where you let me explain. Just oh, I'll just stand back here. <laughs> we have too much fun. Um, so we have this idea that we want to see if you guys want to do where basically during a part of these sessions, we would do personal coaching with somebody. So now of course there's kind of a vulnerability there. Like you would be sharing what, you're struggling with and then we could coach you through it now there is an option at, so we could try that today if we want there's also an option that if you wanted to be anonymous but still get the coaching then we would plan ahead for that and you could log in anonymously and or or hold on you can actually submit or submit just questions. send me a message right now you click on chat private chat instead of hit everyone send a private message to us and we'll see it and then we're we're happy to do some coaching so we can turn these into coaching sessions um, as well and we're happy to do it and this is a safe place this is a great group of people who are trying to be our best and we all have struggles and challenges and it's a safe place where we can kind of share our vulnerabilities and it's also a place where we know like Rachel and I are going to just with absolute love wrap our virtual arms around just you, tell you how it hug, is and we're going to tell you how it is <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we need right that's what we all need we need some straight talk we need someone to hold a mirror up and say look what's going on here and here are some tools, here are some strategies, here are some things to do. So cool. Um, 
There's okay. some interest still. So that's yeah. Good. All right. So think of something. Sweet. We'll do that after. Okay. So we'll hit we'll hit our stuff fast here, and then we'll do some coaching. All right. Are you ready? Are you buckled up? Are you excited, you guys? I got to bring it here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So three things. The first one. Do you guys realize um, we're going to share today the two main reasons why human beings do what they do or don't do what they don't do or don't do what they want to do yeah so they may say like oh, i want to do this but then they don't or they say i don't want to do that but then they do it and you're like what is going on and this comes up all the time in my coaching sessions so i literally get to coach people every single day it's so awesome but they're often saying, well, I know I'm supposed to do that, but I don't do it. I know I'm not supposed to do that. I still do it. What is going on? Well, it's kind of funny because one of the reasons a lot of people don't want to do coaching is because they think, well, I already know the stuff I should do. So what are they going to, what, you know, what's Greg going to tell me that's different or new? And sometimes he doesn't say something different or new, but the power that comes with the coaching is he actually holds them accountable to doing what they know they should do, but don't do. That's where the real power comes from coaching is because, yeah, we all know it. We all know this stuff. And at some point it's kind of, it's really fascinating. Okay. Cause we'll even go through this. We'll pay $10,000 for some training. And part of us are like, well, what are they going to teach us that we don't already know? Right. And at some level, you know a lot of things and where the value comes is these we call them nuggets you get these little nuggets you're like oh one little insight that shifts things that in your shifts mindset. it and wow. sometimes it's something you did know but now because of the experiences you've had or the place you are in your life now suddenly this idea here becomes like gold because it's the perfect thing you need right now so it's all about the nugget but back to the coaching like all, Ultimately, it comes down to, yeah, we know the things that we should do, but we don't do them. Why? That's our end. Are you ready? Okay. Number one is because of identity. Check how I squeeze that horrible looking <laughs> word onto the green paper. <laughs> With a crappy marker. With a crappy marker. I away. Identity. The marker, not the paper. I was like, fine, I'll just. <laughs> okay, identity. Here's why. At a, a profound level, you guys, we all have identity pieces, stories we tell ourselves to take on this identity. And a lot of it was established when we were kids. We took on an identity. Think about this. When your brain is quite literally underdeveloped, because your brain's not fully developed till 25. So you have this like semi-functioning brain and as a kid, you take on a full identity about who you are, how you're going to do life, right? At that point, and then some of us are still operating as adults with this little kid identity we picked up, right? So it's so, like, what, oh. I love this comparison I heard one time from a mentor was, it's like we've installed these apps in our brain and we've never updated them. Like we update our phone all the time, right? And our devices, they have to constantly be updated, but we've installed these apps in our brain. That's when I was 12, this happened and I gave it this meaning and I've never up that. I'm 40 now. I still have that same app, with no updates, right? In other words, <laughs> y'all are operating with, you know, the little green dots <laughs> on the black screen. Like that. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> Some of you don't hear that. Some of you are back in the net, or as our dog says, are back in the, the 1900s. 1900s. Back in the 1900s, right? Like, you guys were born in the 1900s. You're so like, old. We're operating this old stuff. So here's how it plays out. Ready? Here's how it plays out. And I want you guys to think of identities you have. Start thinking of identities of things you, in fact, let's do it right now without any context. Just throw out some things, identities you have, just straight, honest identity, like how you identify yourself. I am. Well, what? I, and you know, I've talked about this a lot before, but one of my identities I'm still working on changing is I'm not an athletic person. And mine is I am an athletic person. Yeah. Right? So that caused them, you know, conflict for a little while. <laughs> you know, like 18 years. <laughs> I was like 16. So 
like now think about it here's here's the and you guys are like well yeah okay whatever but here's where it hits home so powerfully it's so profound whatever you identify yourself to be over the long run will be what you do so you guys have seen me um do the iceberg right have you seen me do the iceberg should i draw an iceberg should i show you can you draw an iceberg i can draw an iceberg with my crappy than the crappy one. Yeah, let me draw an iceberg. This was an epiphany I had uh, Blue? years ago. Blue for an iceberg. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you with me? Can I turn off the So plate? here, so here's the water level. Okay, what? Turn off this light. I don't like this light. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. Woo! So the iceberg, right? is what you see above the water line. Here's the water line. Does that work? Too dark? Uh, it'll work, I guess. Is that yeah. really bad or are we fine? No, it's okay. I think we're good. So here's the iceberg. And what you see above the water, right, is, is and it, it moves and it bounces and it goes all over and you see it. So if you're out here on a boat, these are huge, as big as mountains sometimes. And, and you see it behaving, right? But science has shown us. Well, wait, but this is, these are your habits. These are the things you do every day. This is, the, this, is this is your behavior. Why you're not doing the things you want to do or why you are doing the things you are doing. This is your behavior. Right? So we see you what see other. Oh, you can't see the here. I'll move. So there's the B. For behavior. So what you see, what other people see in you, everything that's above your personality, the, the surface, your just how you are every day, what you do every day. That's that. That's what we see, right? But science has told us that as much as eighty percent that's less than eighty percent of a of an iceberg is below the water. You can't see it. It's below the surface. This is the stuff you don't see. And this right here, my friends, this is identity. In other words, your identity determines your behavior. What's happening below the surface determines what we see and do above the surface, right? Oh, I love this metaphor. It works so powerfully because the bulk of what's happening, what you can't see, all your identity in here and in here is determining what you do on a regular basis. Okay. So back to me, the way that this played out in our life when we were married, I was going to say newly married, but 16 years, <laughs> when he wanted me to work out, he was trying to get me to take the actions, to do the behavior. But what neither of us realized until later, I didn't have the identity. So I didn't want to take the actions. I didn't want to do the things I didn't want. I didn't want to work out. I didn't want to change. So all because the systems, I had, all the tools, all the workout equipment, all the, I mean, yeah. the, the treadmill, the clothes, the exactly. cute workout outfits, like all free the schedule. I'll take the kids. I'll do anything. All of that. None of it doesn't work. Helped because I still had the identity that I'm not an athletic person and I don't like to sweat. <laughs> so here's the conflict. That's why you have the problem. So when you wonder what I want to, I want to do these things. Like I knew conceptually, I understood the idea that exercise was beneficial and positive. I knew conceptually that sweating is a good thing, but my identity created this cognitive dissonance with that. My identity was I'm not a person who sweats and I'm not athletic. So until I change the identity, which I am doing, I'll never change the behavior. So when you wonder why, why can't I do this? Why can't I, you know, make these changes? Why can't I make them stick? Why can't I, you know, keep up these habits? It's because you haven't changed your identity. <laughs> this is so good. I love this stuff. Okay. Let's see it. So, uh, some of the identity pieces, I don't have control, right? Think about that one. You constantly are playing this. I don't have control. I don't have control. Everything's out of my control. I can't think or of anything. Or at least in this one area, it's out of my control, control. right? I'm not an I. I'm not an idea person. I'm not creative. I don't. I don't have any ideas. I don't know how to implement them. Right? We take on that identity piece. 
Let me keep going here. Um, okay, Kenton says, I am a daughter of God. Uh, <laughs> something's a little off there. <laughs> Must be Amy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a loving mother, grandmother, mentor, entrepreneur, master marketer. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Awesome. Um, I'm in a huge time of shift and I'm working on my own new identities and letting go of old ones. It's a painful way to say the old ones and the new ones are still in development. Yeah. That's Cutie. a good thing. Now, hold on, though. Metamorphosis. Then, that's a very good thing. But then the next line is getting you in trouble. You say, cue the uploading icon. <laughs> now, if you take on that identity of like, oh, I'm in this stall mode. I'm stuck. I'm in between changes. That identity could be positive, actually, but but don't, I guess what I'm saying, don't let it stay there. Don't take on this identity of like I'm in change. I'm in this state of transformation. It takes a long time. The reality is, we can make decisions and implement immediately. You and I, we have the power to shift our identity in one moment and then change the trajectory and course of our lives. I think that's that's next level stuff, but it's possible. It's real. Love that. Thanks for sharing, everybody. I'm a homeschool mom, not a career mom. Right? How's that going to help your business if you have, <laughs> I'm not a career mom? Right? This stuff is powerful, isn't it? Isn't this so good? Love it. Um, uh, let's keep going. Immediate implementation is scary. Another <laughs> great story you're telling yourself. <laughs> it's not scary. It's exciting. It's invigorating. It's wonderful. So here's the reality check for all of this. That, that story or the identity is the driving force. It's, it's the bottom of the iceberg and it's determining everything we're doing. Can you see how this is true, my friends? The stories you're telling yourself, the way you identify yourself is determining your long-term behavior. If, if, you, if you clearly and deeply like, identify yourself as a runner, people who say, I am a runner, what do they do? Man, they run. <laughs> what if it's cold outside? What if it's raining? What if it's snowing? They st they're still out running, right? If you're a musician, I am a musician. I'm a pianist, I'm a violinist. I'm a musician. What do you do? Well, you make music. You make time to practice. Other things get neglected because you are a musician. You with me on this? It is so powerful and so deeply ingrained in all of us that for many of us, it is the driving force of why we do or do not do the things that we want to, right? Oh, and, but back to this idea of These are immediate People. implementation is scary. Um, I want to say something about that. I'm just trying to think what exactly I want to say, because the scary part is the, I think the unknown. I think ultimately we get scared by things because we don't know what's out there. We don't know what we don't, we don't know what we don't know. And that can be frightening to us. Now, the reality of it is because we've gone through this like multiple times. <laughs> it's actually not scary. You get there and you're like, what was I afraid of? This is actually better than where I was. Yep. Like this is way better. Then, and that's the reality of it. When you grow and develop, it's, it's better. Like you get there and you're like, wow, this is amazing. What was I afraid of? I was afraid of getting to this. So we're afraid of the unknown, but once we can grasp that the unknown is actually not scary. Now that doesn't mean that you might not, you know, face obstacles or challenges that can be hard. And sometimes hard is scary, but if we, we've talked about the obstacles way, right? Like the obstacle is the way when we learn to understand that taking on those challenges and pushing through those obstacles is what gets us to what we want, then we get excited about it. It becomes exciting. Like, yes, bring it on. Let's do it. Let's go. Because that's how I get to this better life that I want. Yes. So you have to switch that. <clears throat> the yeah. implementation is exciting. And That's I, where the growth happens. I guess I'm we, not done talking. Oh. <laughs> Carry on. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I know for me, and I think for Rachel as well, 
I literally, I switched my identity to the opposite. I used to be terrified of the unknown. It scared me so bad, mostly because I let my imagination run about worst case scenarios. So if mm -hmm. there was any change, if there was any move, if something was uncertain, that I thought of worst case scenarios instead of best case scenarios. Mm -hmm. I was literally putting my imagination to work. Yes. Not in my favor. To your, to your detriment. To my detriment. I switched now. now. I, you guys, I, I gotta share this. My identity is I love change. I love the unknown. I thrive on it. Like my favorite dream is like somehow I fall asleep, they blindfold me and plug my ears and drop me off in a foreign place where I've never been before. And you're like, okay, figure it out. And no money, no friends, no contacts. And I'm like, I'm going to have yes. to do that one day. You're so, or like your, a birthday present. Like 50th birthday. Yes. We're just like, going to drop you off. wait that somewhere. far, like 43rd. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh man, I love that idea because that's my identity. I'm like, oh, I love uncertainty. I love the unknown. I love the challenge. That's not who I used to be. I literally changed my identity. So now when those opportunities pop up, I'm like, bring it. This is my happy place. Um, I was going to say something, but then I was thinking about your birthday party dropping you off. So, so I forgot. You forgot. Because my birthday party distraction. <laughs> okay, here's another one. I have failed so many times. I'm not sure how to succeed anymore. Okay. Oh, I remember. <gasps> I was going to say, if there's one thing to be scared about, this would probably be it, which she perfectly identified there, is using our imagination and our beliefs to create the worst case scenario. That is something you should legitimately be afraid of because you have that power. Whatever you are afraid of, especially if it carries a lot of emotion, that is what you can and will create. So that is legitimately something you should be aware of and I would say terrified of, but I don't want to frame you. <laughs> <laughs> Be afraid, people. No, it is because you'll create those things. Because this is how it works. This is how our brain works. This is how I feel like geeking out on science. I know. Science I feel like geeking like out really here. Really briefly, when you sit here and imagine worst case scenarios, your brain releases cortisol in your body. Well, cortisol, that's the biochemistry of it. So you, you have literally changed your biochemistry. So now your body is filled with cortisol, which causes stress and aging and inflammation and breaks down your immune system. Disease. It puts you, it activates Ultimately. your basal ganglia, which is your fight or flight mode. And you're just in this position, right? If uh, not physically, and, and at you, least mentally. Mentally, emotionally, you drop your head, you bring your shoulders in, you're just like, Ugh. Right? Not to now mention, that changes your behavior and performance. Not to mention the quantum physics, if we want to really geek out here. The quantum physics of this is that you are then sending, okay, if whatever you want to call it, it's a field of energy, it's the light of Christ, it's the, it's like there's lots of different, the Tao, it's like there's lots of different names in every different religion, philosophy, science, everything has this name for this same thing. You send energy into this field and it attracts those things to you. So the more you think about, I failed so many times, I'm not sure how to succeed anymore. Your brain and the field goes to work to prove that to you because that's your belief. Fail. Your fail. belief is I fail. I fail a lot and I don't know how to succeed. So it wants to show you how that's true for you. Yes, you're right. Here's more ways to fail and here's more ways to not succeed. And then you keep playing, I don't know, I don't know. But the reality is, ready? You ready for this? Boom. The reality is having failed so many times, so many times has actually given you an insane amount of knowledge and experience. You actually know you have a an lot advantage. of what not to do. You have a competitive advantage. Fact, you know. the, more, the more you fail, the faster you succeed. Right. In fact, some of the most successful people ever, they asked Thomas Watson, what's the quickest way to success? He says, easy, increase your rate of failure. Huh? Who's Thomas Watson? Thomas Watson is the founder of IBM. And he was super successful. And somebody said, how do I increase my rate of success? He says, easy, increase your rate of failure. So failing multiple times is actually the key to success. You're gaining wisdom and experience. So you do know how to succeed because of a lot of knowing what not to do or how to do it differently. That's it. So switch it. 
I you failed know, so I many times that I'm sure to succeed. Yeah. I know what not to do. I got this. Oh, I love this stuff. Okay, let me hear a couple more things. We gotta roll here. Um, I have things that I do and wear many hats. I feel I'm being torn in many directions, right? So we're like, I got all this stuff. How do I handle it all? I don't know if I can. I'm being pulled apart, right? On the identity piece. Um, I'm always falling short. Which is my... a good thing. Sorry, I just want to add that. That's a great thing. You want to be busy. You want to be because responsible. Because more things to do means more responsibility, which means more growth and development, which means more capability and competence. Yes. Yeah, is this exciting? And if you legitimately, you guys are people. if you legitimately don't want to do them because you decide you don't want to do them, then don't do them, and and or outsource them if they have to be done. Just saying. Okay, another another insight on the comments. I'm always falling short on my own expectations because I depend on other people too much to rise to my expectations. For example, I have high expectations of my kids loving learning and trying new things, but when they start to complain or resist. I guess I kind of eventually tell myself that I will never get where I want to be. Ooh, thank you for articulating that. I think that's something we all experience there. Mm -hmm. we, we have these ideals, we have these expectations, they're all big and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think we do ourselves a disservice because we're like, I'm gonna go out and tell my kids this and they're all gonna be like, <laughs> yes, dad, yes, thank you, thank you're the me. best. I have always wanted to work hard on that. And I go on like, hey guys, we're gonna do this. And like, <laughs> <laughs> and our kids do that like kids are kids that's what they do the right that's human response. nature and now, so i'll go first well all i'm going to say is obviously the, we're like a broken record here you have to come back to focusing on what you can control and focusing on yourself kind of tying into what we talked to before that ultimately you are, yeah, you are responsible because if you have the correct power of influence, then you can influence them in a way that they do get excited about learning. But the other side of that is, do you love learning? And do you love trying new things? And do that your kids see you doing that on a daily basis? And, and One of, with massive action. Not every once in a while, not this, that, and like they consistently see you leveling up and going after it. Now, like hands down, one of the most inspirational and influential things we can do with our kids is for us to be doing, taking action, whether that's reading, studying, achieving goals, and sharing that with our kids. When we come out, we're like, oh my gosh, we learned this. We, we just did this. We just achieved this goal. That right there has huge power. And then without even hardly saying anything else, they're like, you know what, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be better. I'm gonna they just take see more action. It. They see like, it and it like comes, after it. Like, it, like you just like radiate this energy that they wanna be a part of. They want it too. But don't assume, don't assume, how, it begs the question, how many of you are doing things, uh, accomplishing things, but not sharing it with your kids? Your kids are just kind of clueless. Because kids are kind of clueless. They're just like, man, as long as there's food and toys, I'm good. <laughs> like, you got to let them know all the things you're doing. Every time you accomplish something, like, share it with them. Keep this results log where you're just sharing. Even the small accomplishments. Not in a weird way, but like, hey, I did this, I did this, I got this, oh, I feel good. High fives, you go around and Give me a high five because I just did this. Yeah. I just did my morning routine. Let them know what you're doing so they know. Okay, uh, we got to keep moving here. Fear of failure, not being able to change. Okay, that's, that's real. That's the identity piece. Um, but failure only happens if you decide to stop. If you quit, that's when the, the failure. Only, yeah, the only real failure is quitting. Otherwise, you're just learning. Yep. And failure is just fertilizer. You're just fertilizing your success every time you have a failure. Okay, um, Bonham Allison said, love that we can change our identity and not have to stay where we are. And then Shannon asked this great question. She's like, all right. So the next step then is you referring to us explaining how to actually change our identity. Do we just decide and say it over and over to ourselves? Uh -huh. Do we create an affirmation for it? Perfectly done. Actually, yeah, thank you. Cue the, cue the awesome question. <laughs> How do we actually change our identity? Through action. Oh, baby. So the theme is action. And what's interesting is our habits are supported our, our, by our actions. Or our, our actions, if, you, if you're trying to change a habit, it's the actions create a 
beautiful feedback loop. We, we say, well, okay, one side, we believe we are this person, so we take these actions, which reconfirm the belief that we are this person, so we continue taking those actions. Now, this might be a negative thing that you don't want in your life. So first, you have to make the decision of who you do want to be. And then you have to ask yourself, how would that person act, right? So like, you know, some comments have been, well, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to build a business. I don't know how to, whatever it is you want to do. I don't know what action to take. Well, find out. What would that person do? How would they, they behave? What actions would they take? on a daily basis. Find out what those are and then start taking those actions because then what happens is you're telling your brain and God and the universe and every, your, everything else, this is who I want to become. So as you, you take that action, it reinforces that belief. And as you continue taking that action on a daily basis or weekly or whatever is required, you build belief that you are the person you say you want to be. Does that make sense? That's exactly how it works, just like that. I want to be this person, I take that action because that's what this person would do and that reinforces my belief and so I keep taking that action which keeps reinforcing my belief. That's why power habits are so powerful. That's why a habit tracker is so powerful. Yes, that, that specific thing if you put it on a daily tracker and you check it off Which daily, you can print out from that the, is going to totally <laughs> transform your identity. Okay. How come I'm the only one excited about this? Why are there no hands in the air? Why are there no like fist pumps? Why are there no people like, yes, I'm changing my life. This is awesome. Nothing. And then even when I jump around and move, you guys just sit there. <laughs> come on, throw me some fist pumps. Do something like show some excitement. How do you guys show excitement? <laughs> there we go. That was better. That was better. Anyone? <laughs> Okay, you guys, I have, I is this question. how you show excitement in life? I am so excited. I have a question. So, some of you are like, I'm thrilled beyond belief right now. <laughs> now you got to move your body, oh, people. Sorry, I'm distracted oh, by you all my you know what? children. I can, I can get in really deep right now with the whole science behind memorized emotion. You're memorized. In fact, we literally talked about this with our kids this morning. We did a devotional with them, and we talked about you should give them that whole little speech that you did with our kids Thank about you. how most people are what was the word you used? biologically oh this is my term i came up with this yeah. term i was doing some research on it and i'm like oh, most humans live on biological autopilot like they just we're just constantly doing stuff day in and day out unconsciously or non-consciously and it's all just biological autopilot our brain is just responding well that's what i'm gonna hit next if that's the next thing i was going to share of the three it's on biological autopilot. So I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. But before we hit that, like you got to identify, get really clear about who you want to be. And then it's a simple question. What would that person do? So, so let's do Mary's. I'm a homeschool mom, but not a career mom. So now you say, no, I, I'm a career mom and a homeschool mom. What does that woman do? What does she do? And you're like, well, she does this and she does this, she does this. Then you do those things. And you do it and you, so yes, on the question, you know, the question was, do I, do I come up with an idea and repeat it to myself? Yes. But you have to back it up and reinforce it with action. What does that person do? Affirmation do without action is the beginning of delusion. <laughs> <laughs> As Jim Rohn. Okay. The other, what I want to tie in here too, is not only how would they act, but how would they feel? Meaning. Whatever your normal response, and I do this all the time because I am a naturally just kind of, in fact, Greg literally has told me before that I have no pulse and I'm practically dead. He literally has told me that, <laughs> especially when we were first married. What a thoughtful, kind, loving husband <laughs> you have. I'd be like, where's your pulse? Why You're like dead. Jeez, you're just sitting there. <laughs> because I don't like get super excited about I mean, I get excited about stuff in my own way. And like, I get. Ooh, do you know why? Do you know why? Because <laughs> I. She had an identity yeah. of not showing emotion because she was afraid of being embarrassed. 
if I show emotion, what will other people think? They're going to think I'm weird or strange, so I'm not going to show emotion. So she yes. created an identity and shrunk into this little shell of not showing emotion. So even when she was excited or whatever, she just like, I got nothing. Mm -hmm. Right? It was an identity behavior. It was biological autopilot. But what happens is your body memorizes those emotions because of your identity. I'm a person who doesn't get excited about things. And so when something exciting happens or I learn something that's exciting or I want to do something that's exciting, I don't show any emotion. So how can I ever change because I'm not willing to change how I feel? So you have to start thinking differently and feeling differently. You have to think, okay, if this is the person I want to become and this is what I want to achieve, how would that person think and feel? And you have to be willing, and I'm not saying, like, I don't have to be Greg Denny, right? I have to be my version of what that looks like. I don't have to, you know, whatever, be crazy and jump off the walls or whatever. Like, it's my version of what that looks like. But I do need to realize that, in fact, I created this as an affirmation for myself. I change my identity every day. And so when I came to something where my automatic response was something I had memorized in the past, I said, no, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change that. I'm going to respond differently. I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get excited. I'm going to show emotion. I'm going to whatever. I'm switching my identity and I'm trying out new things because that's how you make change. If you continue to continue to think and feel in the same ways, then you just continue to create more of the same of what you already have. You have to change your thoughts and change your feelings to change your life. That's the only way it happens. And if you don't, you'll always you stay at the same level of health, you are. the same level of income, the same level of engagement and presence and joy and happiness and success. You'll just stay stuck. And, and the, the power is in changing your identity. Okay. Um, man, so many good things in here. So, I have a have a habit of quitting, so I'm nervous to share success with my kids or others. So they, so then I think they will expect me to quit again, right? Because now, now you're like, crap! I built there, there's a trust piece. I built a reputation with myself, and I've built a reputation with others. I'm gonna expect to quit. They're gonna expect me to quit again. You've got to change the identity and say, okay, I want to be a person that is not a quitter. Yeah, I'm not a quitter. Well, what is a person who is not a quitter do? How do they persist? How do they follow through? When they feel like quitting, what do they think? What do they feel? What do they do? And do those things. Write that down and say, I'm not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. I'm a finisher. And that, I know for me, that was also one of my hangups with showing emotion or getting excited or sharing my goals or sharing my successes is because I'd already developed this persona of who I was, right? And I didn't want to step outside of that because then people would be like, whoa. Yeah. Well, who are you? What are you doing? This, this is weird. You. This is yeah. different. And because that was who I was, I didn't like that kind of reaction. I wanted to have this, you know, this is who I am. I'm quiet. And I, da, da. and I didn't want to step outside of that and get a response from people of like, wow, this is different. This is new. I, I didn't want that. Right. So I had to change that of like, well, it's okay. That's okay. It's okay for me to become a different person. It's okay for me to show my emotion. Like I'm really kind of quirky. <laughs> and and deal with the criticism that comes from like, well, criticism or any or actions like, or, well, who, you never. What do you think you're doing? Like, who are you? You're not. You're. What are you running? You don't run. I'm what are you running? Run? You're not. What in the world? Why are you acting so weird? Are you yeah. on drugs or something? Like people are gonna say stuff, but it's not always nice. But like, who cares? Like I'm being my best self. I'm leveling up. What are you doing? Right? Oh, I love this. Okay, a couple more things. And Nancy asks, what What do we do if health issues interfere with who you want to be? And um, I want to empathize with that. That can be extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. It really can, and it can get in the way. And and like our our heart and prayers and thoughts go out to you for that. But I do want to invite you to to think of differently. If it were me, and it didn't matter what, if I had lost a leg in an accident, or, I mean, you, there's 
there's examples out there dealing with health issues. Like I'm going to go all in. I'm going games. I'm reading everything I can get my hands on. I'm going to go to um, uh, functional medicine doctors, right? And I'm, I'm going after. I'm not just going symptom management. I'm not, I'm not just going to manage the symptoms. I'm going to transform things as much as I possibly can. And so I'm going to devour like superhuman and the brain warrior's way. And I'm going to get my hands on everything I can to heal my body from the inside out and give me as much potential and, and, and put as many things in my path in my favor as I possibly can. I know a lot of people have health issues. Uh, for example, they have some, some diabetic stuff or they have some gut issues. And I'm like, man, just do whatever you have to do. I, I have family and friends who have some diabetic stuff and they still keep eating the crap. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I just like it. Dude, never touch that again, ever. It's just, there, there's enough variety of healthy stuff. Like, don't eat that stuff ever again. Never, no exceptions. And do whatever you do. And like, if, if you do the research, you realize, man, I, I do cry. I'm throwing out examples. I have to do cryotherapy every day. I have to jump in a freezing cold pool every single day if I want to feel healthy. Done. Do it. Like, just do whatever you have to do. Like, raise your responsibility for as much as you possibly can for your health. So I know for me that I, I've gone through this process mentally because my dad passed away from colon cancer when he was, was 47. 47. So I'm 41. So six years from now was the age my dad was when he passed away from colon cancer. Now we were newly married and had a one-year-old daughter, Kaya. So I have gone through this process in my mind because concerned about genetics, and you know other issues that you know i'm a candidate for colon cancer potentially so i've thought through like li literally i've thought through this a lot like what would i do if i actually did get colon cancer and i've studied all the books and i've studied health and i've nutrition like all this stuff i have dug into this because of that and i am literally to a point where i'm completely confident that if i did ever get it i could heal it now that's because of the things I've read and learned. And I actually kind of had, a, I guess in the way, so it was a chance to practice it <laughs> because just, when was it? A just a ago. few months ago, I actually, I had this sore on my head and I thought it was just, you know, some wound, but then, and I ended up having it for like a year and I'm like, okay, hold on. This is something else. So I went to the dermatologist and it was um, basal cell carcinoma, right? Which is, skin you know, cancer. skin cancer. It's not like a serious form of skin cancer, but it was a form of skin of cancer. And so it was interesting because I had been reading another book again, because of my dad, I'd been reading another book about cancer prevention. And so I said, okay, I'm going to use this as kind of a little test to see if I could actually heal this, right? Put all these beliefs and theories to, to work that I've been studying for years and see if I could actually do it. So I changed my diet even more, like I stepped it up even more from where it was. I already have a pretty good diet and that's because we started our marriage with my dad dying. So we've always been super healthy, but I leveled it up even more. And then I looked into natural therapies for healing. And at this point, like it's completely gone. And that only took me like three months to get rid of an open wound of skin cancer. And it's now gone with natural with products. just completely natural changing diet and then natural remedies like i'm talking about like lemon juice and like different things like this actually the science shows that lemons and garlic, citrus garlic, garlic oil. kill cancer like garlic so, I didn't smell like garlic. <laughs> so ah, when you yeah, say baby. so bringing this back here when you're saying well what if i have health issues that are preventing me remember the obstacle is the way if health issues are your obstacle that is your opportunity to grow and develop. That is your chance to bring out the best in yourself let me, by healing yourself. Let me flip this entire thing on its head. Every single one of us have health issues that are preventing us from our greatness. Every one of us, right? There are things you cannot do physically because you haven't conditioned your body for it, that you're limit, you have limitations. If I invited you all to climb Kilimanjaro with me right now, would you be ready? Nor would I, right? 
we got to train for this stuff. We got to prepare for it, the eating and the exercise, all that stuff. We all have health issues that are preventing us from being our best. Let's get serious about it. Get serious about your health. Like dead serious. Take on a new identity that I'm just, and that I just live for extreme health. That was another thing that helped me to change my identity about not being an athletic person. I decided to take this identity of I'm, I'm an outdoor active person, right? Cause that to me seemed more in line with who I wanted to be. And I wanted to pick up that identity because my husband is so active and my kids, right? <laughs> so I'm, it, it got to the point where I was starting to miss out on things I could literally could not do with them because I was not healthy, fit or active enough. So when I realized that's not, who I want to be. That's not what I don't want to be the one that's always missing out. Now I'm still not quite where they all are. Right. But I'm able to participate in more because I have been tra training and I've changed my identity about that. And it was actually enjoyable. She did some big hikes with us and likes mm -hmm. them instead of suffering through them. Because There's she's some changed. suffering. <laughs> <laughs> not going to lie. <laughs> but I, but no, I did and enjoyed it. I'm glad I, I wanted to go on it. I enjoyed it. I'm glad I did it. I want to do it again. In fact, Greg was just saying today. So we're trying to plan our 20th anniversary trip, right? Next March. So we're trying to plan, like, what are we going to do? And so we thought of some different ideas, but the most recent one we were talking about was Galapagos Islands. And then he's like, well, if we go to Ecuador, we should hike this big mountain. That's there. Cotopaxi. Cotopaxi. I'm like, okay. So that's the most epic 20th anniversary let's, date let's ever. Do it. <laughs> Get up to 19,000 feet in a mountain and then go sail around the Galapagos. On a cruise. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me ask you. Okay. Things here. Anyway. Um, do we have some psychological, psychological, emotional resources to go more deeply? I'd recommend As a Man Thinketh by James Allen um, and Out from the Heart by James Allen and read those. I've read that book over 50 times. Read it, devour it, memorize the thing. I'd also recommend um, The Untethered Soul by Michael yes. Singer. Absolutely fantastic book. Um, um, well, if you want to really go deep on the connection between mind, emotions, and the quantum field, breaking then the breaking habit. the habit of being yourself by uh, Joe, be prepared to have your mind blown. Joe Dispenza. <laughs> Joe Dispenza. Woo! Mind blown. Breaking it will the blow habit your mind. of being yourself. And he talks specific, there's something that's called um, congruence, where you have to get the, it's basically your brain waves and your thoughts lined up emotionally with your heart waves and your emotions right so once you can get those in congruence because often we're like this we're thinking we might be thinking positive thoughts but we're feeling negative thoughts and so it's incongruent when we start to get our thoughts and our emotions lined up and congruent and i'm doing this because i can't do waves with my fingers um that's called congruence and that is when we really start to create change real change happens when we become congruent that's right so that is a yeah a real book miriam raising your hand i knew the i knew the van cromans be excited about the ecuador piece yeah. i'm a little bit jealous right now because oh there. yeah they're there um okay so i'm, I'm gonna hit a couple more things here i want to hit hit um i need to trust miriam has her hand up and go forth so, what, ideas, what, give, me the the give me the author giving me give me the author of breaking um, bold again like you mentioned earlier Extreme ownership. Yeah, buddy. Okay, Miriam, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, shoot. Oh, because oh, we're on. on this. So, <coughs> okay, we're going to try this. Ready? Go for it. Can you hear me? Because now I can't hear you. Okay, so two things. So breaking the habit of being yourself, author. I missed the author again. Oh, type. And then, and then, okay. What do you do? What What do I do if I've been? I can tell right now that this is what I'm doing. What Rachel was showing, where I'm thinking one way, but 
my actions they're they're not being congruent which is why i'm having such a struggle with getting any leverage i guess on you know my control of my emotions or interactions with my kids um i'm doing the affirmations i'm reading the books i'm you know doing my daily habits but i'm still getting the Oh, are you giving me all that mindset crap again, mom? And and you're being such a hypocrite and it's not, it's not working. So why am I going to listen? And so then I just keep getting this negative feedback loop of this isn't working. Why should I try it? Because it's not helping you any. And so it feels a little bit discouraging, even though I've been trying to do all those things. Okay, we've got to hit all kinds of different buttons here to make this work. Um, Miriam, thank you for sharing that with us, for being willing to be open and honest. I want to praise you and honor you for trying, mm -hmm. for putting in the effort. It's hard. Um, mm -hmm. Some things like that, especially where we have those memorized emotions that are literally in us at a cellular level, it's tough. Sometimes we're doing superficial healing on a deep internal issue and it can be super hard. So I want to praise you, honor you, celebrate you. I hope you celebrate your achievements. Um, as you know, as your kids are noticing and giving you a hard time when we're trying to make changes that people are so, they're just waiting for us to slip up. Ha! See that crap doesn't work. Oh, you're a hypocrite. I mean, they're just waiting there for it. Don't let it get to you. Um, well, what I would say is maybe let it get to you and then use it as an opportunity to understand yourself better. So whenever I feel triggered, that's what we call it, triggered by my kids, Greg, anyone else in my, that I come in contact with, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I am feeling a lot of emotion from this, right? So I, what I, when I'm working through that, especially... I will go off by myself and I will like write about it or talk out loud or whatever you feel like doing and process that. Do we lose? Oh no, she's there. I'll process that and I'll work through why am I feeling so much emotion about this? And when I can get to the heart of why I'm feeling that and very often why I'm feeling that is some of those things I've shared today of, well, I'm afraid of being this person who my kids don't trust because I talk big, but I never actually do, right? That's one of my core things. That's why I can share that with you because I've been triggered before and been able to get down to the deep level of why I feel like that. And the reason I feel like that is because this is a moment of vulnerability for me because I feel like in some ways that's what my dad did. Now, my dad was a change maker in his life because his dad was an alcoholic and his dad was abusive and my dad stopped that so he was a great guy but he also had big dreams that he never fulfilled in fact i literally think he gave up living because he felt like he could never achieve his big dreams so he would share these big goals and dreams of we're going to live in a big house and we're going to do these things and we're going to all of this. But he ended up dying. So for me, that is my fear. I don't want to set my kids up for that and then not be able to fulfill it. But do you know what? Even though that was something that was in me and I had to work through it, I, at this point, I am grateful to my dad because he literally put me on the path. He gave me a love of reading. It's because of him that I, <laughs> wow. It's because of him that I love reading because he had books everywhere. And it's because of him that I started thinking of bigger dreams and I started on this whole personal development path. It's because of him. So worst case scenario, you're only helping your kids. Even if you, for whatever reason, don't achieve all the things you want to or dream of, it's not hurting your kids. It's not hurting you to start on the path. 
because you're helping them. You're, you're building this foundation, which is what my dad did that I can now build on. Beautiful. Love it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to share, Miriam, and for all of us, is we need to create new memorized emotions. We need to get to a cellular level of feeling great all the time. If, if oh, I under which just, sorry. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. That's why I just stopped. But which goes back to that idea of getting to the core of those emotions. Sorry. Go, go. When you're triggered, get to the core of those emotions. Because when you can feel them and when you can understand what causes them, when you're like, it's because my dad did this and that's why I feel this way and that's why I'm so terrified that I'll do this, that's when healing and change happens. That's when you're able to make the changes because otherwise we're still, we're operating on this automatic biological thing because we're not actually understanding why we're feeling like that. Why is what my kid's saying making me feel this way? Because ultimately that's what it's about. We start to have more influence with them when we understand ourselves better and work through our own emotions. So then we have better understanding and greater clarity that we can use to then influence them on a higher level. But until we've processed that ourselves and worked through that ourselves, we don't have the power to help them work through it. So a lot of you have, again, biological autopilot. You've got some emotions that are your predominant emotions that you're feeling most of the time. Some of you feel worried a lot. Some of you feel grumpy a lot. Some of you feel blah a lot. Some of you are happy. Some of you are joyful. Some of you are grateful. Some of you are energized. Some of you are just dragging yourself through the day. And it becomes this predominant emotion that seems to like govern our whole lives. And you can get really, really intentional about shifting that. We do a gratitude exercise that I think is one of the most powerful things we've done emotionally, where you just, you, it's three minutes long, three different things. So you spend one minute in deep feeling of gratitude about one thing, right? one minute, one thing, one, one minute, next thing. And you, and you do every day you do it and you can do different things, do the same things, but you literally stop It's three minutes. You guys, every one of us can find three minutes. And in that three minutes, for me, it can generate so much positive emotion, not just thoughts. It's not just circle surface. It's feeling. And it gives me such a great feeling. And I can do that at any spot during the day at any time. I can stop and I can generate the feeling that I want. So talk about action, right? And our first step for action is decide who you want to be and how they do life. Then you stop. If you're not being that person, stop and literally change your emotional state. So at any, any time, man, I got to drive this home. At any moment during the day when you are not emotionally where you want to be, stop and change your emotional state. That may take some dancing. You turn on favorite song and dance around. It might be writing. It might be meditating. It might be yoga. It might be just moving your body and jumping up down being silly and just goofing and whatever. Like change your emotional state. Do not let that negative emotional state continue to perpetuate in your life. And I also want to add back to this idea of, because like you're talking about, many of us go through life in these memorized emotional states where often the only thing that changes it is a trigger from someone in our family that then puts us into a more negative state, usually. So if you're going through life with these memorized states and then you're triggered by something that puts you in another memorized negative emotional state. So one option, of course, is to change your state that way. The other is to process what you're feeling and get to the root of what's causing it. And then I just want to add that oftentimes that's one of the things that has bonded me with my kids. Not, not in the moment, not when I'm upset, not when I'm angry, not when I'm hurting. But if I can go and process those emotions and figure out what's causing me to feel that way and then go to my kids in sincerity and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I did this. And this is why, because I'm afraid of being this kind of person. I'm afraid of whatever it is, because often it is fear that's driving us. Yeah. When you can share that with your kids, this isn't the positive you know, mindset talk. This is open, authentic vulnerability. It affects them in a good way. 
and you. Because they see you as a human being who's trying. You're a person who's trying to change. And yeah, you're not perfect. And yeah, you make mistakes. And yeah, all these other things. But you are trying. And they will see that. You need to be able to show that to your kids in an appropriate way. What? Hand up again. What? Um, one last thing I want to share on this. You, we often do ourselves a huge disservice if we don't anticipate certain things. Anticipate um, the responses. <laughs> anticipate negative responses. I have a wonderful client, super awesome. She is a working mom. And she said every day I would go home and the dishes would not be done and the house mm -hmm. would be a mess and the kids would be sitting on the couch watching TV with dad. And she said, I'd blow a gasket every time. And I'm like, well, did that surprise you after the hundredth time? And she's like, well, no. And I'm like, you still at home blew a gasket? She's like, well, yeah. And she kept expecting it to be different without doing anything different, right? Without setting up a different system. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this. And she, our meeting was, she was at her office. I'm like, you're going to go home in a minute. What do you think is going to happen in the house? She's like, well, the dishes will be done. The chores won't be done. They'll be watching TV. I'm like, hey, well, you know that's going to happen. Anticipate it. You know that's going to happen. What kind of emotional response do you want to have? Your best self. You know, you know the dishes are not going to be done. What kind of emotional response do you want to have? And she's like, I just want to go home and love on them anyways. That's what my best self would do. I'll walk in. I'll see the, the dishes were not done. I'll see the chores were not done. And I'll walk in there. And I'm just going to be happy anyways because it's driving this wedge between us. I'm going to be happy. And then I'm going to go in with a positive attitude. And I'm going to help them gently get up and do their chores, right? And so we got in this emotional state and she's like, I'm going to be good. No matter what I find at home, I'm going to be good. I'm going to go home. If it's a total disaster and they're sitting there fighting, I'm still going to be loving and positive because that's who I want to be. You know what she told me next time we met? She's like, every time I set myself up to go through the door with a positive state, all the chores were done. <laughs> so I walked in there and That's like quantum like, physics right exactly. there. Exactly. It was that. And she's like, holy crap. I decided to be happy no matter what. I walked in. They've done their stuff without me saying anything. I'm like, boom, yeah. Right? And she's like, when it has to happen, when they fought, she's like, I'm in a different place. I'm in a different place emotionally because I decide ahead of time, even if I know it's going to be negative, even if they're going to fight or they're going to say mean things, I'm not going to react to that. I'm going to be in a state where I want to be in. So you can just say, I'm going to go to work today and so-and-so is probably going to say something negative and it's, going to, it's not going to work out. What am I going to be anyways, in spite of that? And when you choose that emotion, then they go ahead and do what you expected and you're like, okay, I saw that coming and I'm not going to react to it. I'm going to be deliberate. I'm going to be way more proactive. Can we change that? Yeah, one wow. thing, uh, this is an interesting, we, you know. We have a lot of I one know, things. I'm sorry, gosh. It's kind of interesting here because we want to have high expectations and we feel like that's a good thing and it is a good thing, but sometimes it's a bad thing because, again, you don't rise to the level of your expectations, you fall to the level of your training. So you should have high expectations, but you need to realize that everybody's going to operate in your life according to how you've trained them. So if your training is not up to par, then you might have the expectations but this is where it's happening so you have to change you have to expect this right not this goal expectation type but just expect reality of like this is where it is and so i literally do this all the time still if there's something that's off that's not how i want it to be i'm like okay what training do i need to do to make this happen so it gets closer to my expectation right the training so I expect that things are going to happen this way because that's where the training is. Or I become aware of like, oh, this is where the training is with this. And then I have to implement the systems and the training and the influence to get it up closer to where I want it to be. Otherwise, you will literally spend your life in a state of frustration and disappointment. Irritation. And irritation if your expectations are high and your training is low. You will live in a perpetual state of frustration, irritation, and disappointment. That's lame. Raise the level of training for yourself or others. Holy guacamole. Okay. Okay. So we actually got to the first thing. I'm just going to, I'm going to share these and then I'm going to make videos this month about it. Right. The next step is pain and pleasure. 
pain pleasure paradigm. The pain pleasure paradigm is where you're operating on biological autopilot, right? That's, that's a term I came up with. Biological autopilot where your brain is wired to avoid at all costs, avoid things that you fear, even to your own Painful. detriment, even in self-sabotage and self-destruction, you're avoiding pain. Now, not, not in a physical pain, but might be mental pain, of like a, a embarrassment, sweating, of fear. <laughs> so Rachel had this pain of the pain of sweating because she was embarrassed as a, as a youth, because her face would get red and then they'd have to do the communal showers like they did in middle school back then. So she so I associated pain, pain to, to sweating out. It's sweating. Out. So done. Not not physical pain. Just it was emotional pain. And so her in her life, she would literally do anything to avoid actually working out and sweating. And it was it was it, it wasn't logical. Right? It was unreasonable. And so the reason you and I do things or don't do things sometimes is because we have in, intense amounts of pain associated with certain things. Either emotional or physical. So maybe you know you need to eat better, but somewhere along the way you attached pain or pleasure. You know, if you attach, pleasure to junk food and pain like, to health food, maybe. I, I just health had this experience food. when I was a little kid. I went out with my mom, and we had the most special day. And she bought a package of Oreos. No, I'm gonna. And so you attach insane amounts of pleasure to Oreos, and you're back there as your little kid, like, no, but Oreos are special because I love my mom. You're like, that's special. That is awesome. But those Oreos are killing you. You're like, yeah, switch it. Well, I, I have to share this perfect example. Greg and I were married when my dad passed away. I'm the oldest of my siblings. I'm the oh, oldest of I six think I children. Know this yeah, one. you know what's coming. So we really went through the whole process of him dying. He, my dad literally got diagnosed with cancer one week after Greg and I went out on our first date. Okay. Greg and I were not, <laughs> we did not date very long. We were married within three months of our first date. And <laughs> my, they gave my dad three to six months to live after he was diagnosed. So Greg asked my dad if he could marry me in the hospital because he had just had a colon, what's it called? Colonoscopy. No, no uh, colostomy. colostomy. They'd taken out his colon. Okay, so our, it's very much a part of our marriage and life, this whole thing of my dad dying when we were first married. All my siblings were younger. My brother was actually on a mission for our church during this, a lot of this process. So they missed out on a lot of this stuff. To us, it meant we are going to live a healthy life no matter what, because we're going to live a long time. We're not going to die at 47. To the rest of my family, they kind of missed that. Besides the fact that my dad really went in through, my dad used natural methods to prolong his life. Prolong his life. They gave him three to six months. He lived two, two and, and a half years. years. And part of that is because he actually did a strictly raw diet for a while, which is great for cleansing and detoxing. It's not, I don't believe it's sustainable long-term, but it's a great detox and cleanse. And then use natural methods and he sustained his life two and a half years. And I, and I literally believe he actually gave up or he could have lived longer, but my siblings didn't see this. So do you know what they do every year to celebrate or to remember his life, to celebrate his birthday? They go to an ice cream place and eat mint chocolate chip ice cream. Cause that was my dad's favorite ice cream before he got sick to me. I'm like, that makes no sense. He died because he ate poorly. And this is sci the science behind it. I am not celebrating his life like that. I am celebrating it by making good choices and living healthy. So I, to me, I'm like flabbergasted. Like, but I get it because they didn't go through the same process that we did. They didn't see him dying before their eyes. I mean, they did, but we were involved in the, we were old enough. We were you're in our and, 20s. And we were there, and they would wake us up on the rough, rough, rough nights. And so we literally watched him die. We were there for the whole thing. They weren't. And so we realized we had attached pain to unhealthy food because his oncologist yeah. literally said, you are dying because of the way you've been eating. So we attached pain to it. They still attach pleasure to it. Because they associate positive memories of it, they would go to my favorite, it was his favorite ice cream place, you know, while we were growing up or whatever. And now they're perpetuating to their kids this 
tradition, this attachment. But see how the same thing can provide pain or pleasure depending on the meaning you give it. So if you want to change it, you have to change what meaning you give it. If it's something pleasurable to you now, you have to associate pain with it if, you, if it's something you need to get rid of. Does that make sense? So this ties into the identity piece, right? You have this identity of who you are and that determines your actions, but your actions are, until you become aware of them and consciously take, choose the actions you're going to take to create the identity you want, your actions are automatic. They're this biological- Autopilot. Uh, autopilot, <laughs> I can't remember, you made up. Um, <laughs> you're on autopilot. So you have to switch the association you have in order to switch the actions in order to alter the identity. Does that make sense? I love this stuff. Oh man, it's good. This is powerful. It's so good, you guys. Okay, so um, Shannon asked, um, hold on, a couple things. Could you specify your number two and three steps for action? First identity, no, so sorry. First is identity. Um, first is identity. Second is pain and pleasure. We have to give meaning to things differently. Right? Second, you have to change. If you've attached pain to something that you know is good for you, you've got to switch that. You gotta yeah. see it as pleasurable. I have to start making, associating pleasure to sweating, and right? If, if you've attached <laughs> pleasure to something you know is not good for you, like, like junk food or, or just watching stupid movies all the time or whatever, like something like, oh, but it's just, we just as a family, we just watch a movie every single night. I'm like, holy moly, like you're literally <laughs> hanging gonna say over. every single week. I'm like, you watch a movie every Yeah, week. once a week's okay. Every night? I, and I know people do this. They watch they watch a couple um, episodes of a TV series or a movie every single night. And I'm like, you're man. No wonder you have time to do the things you want to do. If you, if you attach too much pleasure to that, that ought to be painful because that's a waste of life. Because <laughs> you're not you know you're not living your own story. You're living through somebody's story. And then the third one is massive action. Third one is massive action. You've got to take massive action. And I'll do videos about this this month in there, you guys. you got to log in there and watch those videos because we, we don't have time today to go through them all. But if you want massive results, you can't take a piddly little action. Like a lot of people, they want million-dollar results with a minimum wage effort. This is unacceptable. It's not going to work. Well, yeah, unacceptable in that it doesn't add up. It doesn't work. So it doesn't work. You want massive results off of a minimum commitment. And so we have to take massive action, massive action. And it, it almost, with some things you need to get a little bit obsessed, a little bit unreasonable. Your life has to get a little bit out of balance so that you can get it back in balance. You know At I mean? a higher level. Like some of you are gonna need to make, make some drastic changes to get your health where you want it to be. Some of you are gonna have to make some drastic changes to launch your business. Well, like an example, back to, you know, back to my own examples here, um, with this book that I had read about, can't, it, was, it was written by this guy who literally healed himself from cancer. I don't know if it was colon cancer or another type of cancer, but anyways, he had healed himself from cancer, and the whole premise of his book was basically, I was willing to do whatever it took to do that. So he took this massive action because he wanted the result of being healed from cancer, right? So when you're willing to, when you want something so bad that you're willing to do whatever it takes, like that's when the real power comes in because you are willing. And we're not saying everything has to be like that. Not every part of your life necessarily has to have that. Like some things you can make small change. We've talked a lot about the 1% changes. Like that applies a lot of the time. Like it really is a powerful thing. But sometimes you literally do have to take the massive action. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes. And it's very often, and we're telling you from experience, our own experience, very often that is sometimes drastic. Right? I mean, how many times have we done drastic changes? And what it does, very, it like, it, it, 
it's this pattern interrupt. It like literally takes you from your memorized emotions, memorized feelings, memorized thoughts. You're in this environment that's producing more of the same and you just throw it all off. And it shifts everything. Like it shifts your thinking. It shifts your feelings because you're not in the same thing. You're not doing the same things you've been doing. It's suddenly new and you have to think instead of in automatic autopilot, right? You now have to think, well, gosh, I used to do that, but man, things are different now. So now I got to think about what I'm going to do. In fact, I honestly believe that that's probably one of the things that has been a benefit for us in our life. We spent 12 years being nomadic, right? Where I, I, I literally think we've moved like hundreds of times. <laughs> we were constantly in a new environment. So all the time we're rethinking how we do things. We didn't, we didn't get into this automatic autopilot stuff because we were constantly changing where we shopped, what we ate, what currency we were using, what language we're trying to communicate. Like everything was changing all the time. So we were constantly evaluating everything, every part of our life. Why do we eat this? Why do we do this? Why do we say this? Why do we go here? Why do we think this? Like we're reevaluating everything and that, like gave us power to just level up because you're not on autopilot. You're thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Love That's it. where the power comes. Yeah. Be, be way more proactive than you are reactive. Okay. One last question. Then let's do a quick coaching session. If anyone has a question they want to do coaching on. Um, yes. So actually having a hard time knowing what rewards to give kids when they complete a goal or have it has been a food treat, but I don't want to do that anymore. And that's a really great insight there and a great awareness because what you'll do is you'll actually establish this pleasure connection and emotional eating. So your kids will get like food as a reward and that when you eat food as a reward, you're going to overeat. Well, <laughs> but, I, but I do want to say that's not, ne it depends on the age of the kids in some ways. It's not necessarily. But that's when you're it establishing. Depends how, it depends how it's used. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And again, it depends on what's happening. Like sometimes, depending on the age of the child and the goal, like sometimes just achieving the goal is the reward. Like there's not necessarily a, a reward. Now for younger kids, that's not necessarily true because they are not abstract thinkers. Like they're very concrete. So, so if, if it's like clean up your room or pick up these things and you get a, you know, whatever, a little treat, like that's okay. That's fine in my mind. But if it's like, you know, do this thing, I'll take you out for ice cream or whatever. Like it just kind of depends. You have to think through it and analyze. And if that's the every time thing or a once in a while thing. So we're not saying, you know, it's not, I don't know. And so, well, I guess what, I'm just trying to. What we, do, what we do with our older kids, we just say, what is something you really like? So they like maybe a, a Lego set or a toy or they want a specific thing and, or they want something that costs a certain amount of money and say, okay, as you do these things, you get, you know, a couple dollars here, a couple dollars there, and we like, help them save up. So we help, we actually help them reach more goals when they accomplish yeah, their goals. That's another so we're thing actually too. building into more achievement, more growth, and we're doing it in a healthy way. So there's some balance there. So, yeah. So sometimes the reward could be some money or it could be, yeah. Okay. So we have, uh, we have a coaching question that came in. We're going to just hit it real quick. Cause I have a, I have a youth class. I got to hit. Oh yeah. The question is about a child that has severe anxiety so much so that she's sleeping in the bedroom, in the parents' bedroom, be out of fear. And so it's disrupting, um, routines, patterns, behavior. It's just, it becomes really disruptive. Um, and, and this is, this is becoming very, um, Okay, so this is becoming, it, it becomes disruptive. And you guys, it's a huge problem. Um, anxiety has just gone off the charts in the last few years. And I think there's multiple reasons for that. Our whole society has changed. Our whole dynamics have changed. I'm actually creating a full course right now all about anxiety because it's become a big deal. And, and my guess is there's that a lot of you have fear, experienced some anxious feelings. Um, or you have family members that do. I mean, we're all connected to people who are f experiencing some of this. In the few minutes we have, <laughs> we can't hit it all because I'm going to go through a whole course on it. Maybe we can even do a full training just on this. But 
So again, major pieces here. Major pieces well, are sorry, identity. Do we know? I'm, I missed some of the questions. Do we know the age of the child? Do we know? She's, I think, early the teens. The cause of the anxiety. Well, that's, we're looking at the cause. Okay. But we're looking at input. So part of it is identity, right? They'll, they'll take on some identity. We have a couple of children that are very, they have a tendency towards fear and anxiety. And we think through like, what's their thinking process? What's going on? Sometimes you guys, and this is going to sound a little, little crazy. Sometimes anxiety, depression, et cetera, are literally triggered by food. And I know that seems crazy, but it, it does it because it goes in and it, it, it hits one part of the brain that makes it hyper, hyperactive. And so there are food substances or chemicals in the, in the foods that literally cause this stuff. For example, well, they found that low fat diets actually induce depression, right? Because the brain needs fats to stay healthy and functioning. So one of the things I'd look at food, we went and got a brain scan on one of our children that has a lot of anxious feelings. And we realized in the brain scan, they took a literal picture that her basal ganglia is hyperactive. It's on all the time. So Which doctors is fight like, or flight mode. Yeah, fight, flight, or freeze mode all the time. So it shuts down the prefrontal cortex, activates fight, flight, or freeze, and hers is active all the time when there's no threat. Right. Which also I was going to say, which is contributing to a lack of GABA in her own brain. So GABA, like there's all kinds of biochemicals in our brains, right? That are being produced or need to be produced in order for your brain to function at its best. So if you have too little or too much, say, say you have too much cortisol and not enough dopamine and you know, you're going to be depressed or if you have not enough GABA. It's affecting your body's ability to like calm itself, right? So that's why you would feel a lot of anxiety. So at some point here, there is some sort of biochemical um, stuff that's going on, right? Sorry. Yeah, so, no, I was just saying, she was like, you can elaborate if you want to. And you can elaborate. I think, well, maybe we, maybe Wait, we don't have time today. she's saying she needs me no, to she, elaborate? She can elaborate more if she want, if okay. we want her to. Um, we talked too long and Greg has a class in 15. Yeah, minutes. we so just we love going. Quick. This is what happens when you read thousands of books. We promised this coaching, and now we're like, we gotta do this quick because we're here. Let's and... let's do another one soon, and we'll meet up. And we'll well, talk I have about another this. one scheduled. Okay, I would put her on a GABA supplement immediately. We got to get some GABA. That's very calming. It's a natural supplement. It's a it's a chemical our bodies produce. Um, I would say what? you have to totally transform all input. Input determines output. So I'm gonna make sure the diet is crystal clean. I'm gonna put on a GABA supplement. I'm gonna make sure that the sleep is solid and there's recovery happening. I well, because what's scan. happening, at least what was happening with our daughter was um, because this basal ganglia is activated, she's not getting enough good sleep, which is not producing enough GABA, which then it's, again, this Petrus. feedback loop that's perpetuating. And she doesn't sleep because her brain is sleeping with one, white, one eye open, so to speak, because she lives in constant fear. So now we're, we're talking about this because ultimately everything comes down to your biochemistry. And so if there's anxiety, in fact, you know, when we talked to the doctor who did this brain scan and we did the brain scan With through Dr. the Amen clinic, yeah, Dr. Daniel Amen clinic, um, the, the doctor says these certain patterns are very common and it means these things. So if you're experiencing anxiety, it's likely that there's a similar pattern going on in the brain. So it's the basal ganglia being activated, right? So in order to calm the basal ganglia, one of the things they need is, well, more restful sleep, obviously, and GABA is one of the things that does that. Now, there's a lot more to it, of course. We could go in a lot deeper, but that's one of the things, is the, bi the literal biochemistry of the brain, which is producing the feelings of anxiety or depression, or all these other things, which is affected by food, supplements, whether, you know, especially if they're not getting enough, um, and even, then input. Even some blood work can be really good. To say You might yeah. find some major deficiencies, like, oh man, you're super low on iron, you're super low on vitamin D. Like, there's all these things in there that, that 
totally change your chemistry. And so you have this propensity to do it and then transform input. It has to be only positive input. I would do very little, if any screen time at all. I would well, be filtering all the books and all the, just the input, the music, everything. I see this happening a lot. There's so much negative music, so much negative screen time input. It's actually perpetuating this in a lot of people in a major way. I guess limiting the screen time in that, that, and we try to teach our kids this a lot is that we have to be super intentional about what we're doing on a device and why we're, what our purpose is. Right. And of course, scientists are seeing this a lot where there's this direct connection between anxiety with teens because of social media. And connected to that, you spend so much time looking at screen. So you don't move your body. When you don't move your body, your mind gets into a different state. And actually when you look at screens, it decreases blood flow to your brain. So there's all these different things going on because oxygen is like gas to the brain. So you have to get more oxygen into your brain by getting your blood flowing. Right. So this is a lot of, this is like a fire hose right now, but um, <laughs> the, the recommendation that we received for our daughter was, was exercise, of course. And they said, first thing in the morning, you should be moving your body She's because like, it's hitting that gas pedal. you're putting, pushing the gas pedal of oxygen to your brain. Um, GABA supplements, diet. In fact, she's, she was trying to be nice no and was sugar. like, you know, you shouldn't be eating sugar and no fast food, no junk food, no processed food, more fats. Just lots of healthy fats or the, some of the top things. So this is true so for we all don't... of you guys, every one of us in our families, we should be following these same things because that's what sets up for a healthy brain and healthy emotions. Because should I we do this next time. Because... We should dive into details of this next time. <laughs> because one of the things that we've be this become super clear to us back way back in the day when if you first knew greg and denning we were all about just positive thinking like you can positive think everything right everything is all about the positive thinking well as we've learned more and grown and you know expanded we, we found out it's true <laughs> <laughs> no you know where i'm going with this we found out that it's not enough on its own positive thinking is powerful but you have to get your biochemistry working too. Our bodies are heavily affected, strongly affected by our biochemistry, which is directly affected by the way we move our bodies or don't move our bodies and what we eat or don't eat. It has a huge effect. In fact, it has more of an effect than we used to believe. That's what I'm, that's what I'm going to say. So yeah, mindset positive thinking all of that is important but at some point it actually it's not going to work unless you get your biochemistry it's not going to work as well let me dial in so unless now, you get your biochemistry we, we need to do this i'm happy to spend a lot of time on this one because i know it's a prevalent problem and i'm again i'm building that whole course but if it were if it were my child i would like okay i'm going full engagement full frontal all in we are going to eat amazingly. I'm going to figure out all the recipes where the food can be delicious and nutritious. There's no we eat sugar. good, guys. We we eat we good. Did. We, we good. Did. No, our uh, like we like to eat, and we eat food that tastes delicious, but it's also very healthy. So it's not like you have to be eating kale and. But you can eat really well. So I'm going to eat really well. There's no sugar Kale's coming in the too. house. We're going to strictly, strictly, like I find my kids and my own mind gets emotions get adjusted by what we're, what we're seeing, what we're consuming, whether it's songs or movies. So we think some of these movies are harmless and it's just scaring the crap out of our kids. Just literally. So there's a lot of it Which out there. Which some kids can handle it more than others. That's also some true. Some just can't. They watch it and it just freaks them out. Messes so with like their brain. When you try to find out what's scaring them so much, and you work through it, you're processing it all, you find out if they're afraid of some monster they saw in some movie or some, they're really just reliving this one experience and feeling this memorized emotion now because they watched um, A Quiet Place. <laughs> right? It, I'm, I'm not kidding, man. It messes with some people so bad. So I'm going to change all that. We're going to do supplements. We're going to do blood work and do brain scan. Like we're going all in and to retrain all of this and, and whatever the fear is, we're going to gently go towards it. And so realize it's safe. There's no reason to be afraid of it. And we're going to work through those whole things. Okay. Um, uh, you guys, we got to wrap up because I got time here, but love you all so much. What? You um, can't see the. Oh. Yeah. Yep, there it is. So oh, yeah. same thing. So you see, you see the list of bugs. You see a list of animals. You see whatever they'll touch yeah. on. Yeah, same thing. Our child has 
phobias that seem unrealistic, but again, it's all connected to this biochemistry that's happening in her brain. Exaggerated. Okay, we'll, we'll hit this more, you guys. Um, love we'll you. We'll do a better you guys are coaching awesome. job next time. And thanks for being here. Thanks for being just great human beings. Let's level up our actions. Like work on the identity, the pain and pleasure, and taking massive action. And, and log into the, the members area. I'm going to make a bunch more videos about this and, and share this stuff. Love you guys. Have an awesome, awesome week. Reach up. What do I do first?